First of all, thank you for having me. And um, so my name is Robert Durso. I'm a pianist and a piano teacher here in Philadelphia and in New York. Uh, and I am a co-founder of the Golansky Institute, which is in residence at Princeton University in July. And um, I have a piano trio called the Belmonte Trio with Jennifer Lee and Glenn Fishbach. So we perform regularly. And I have a large teaching studio because my primary association is with the Talman work. So Bob, we met through Facebook and then we shared a concert together. What's the role of social media for musicians today? It used to be that impresarios seemed to take care of everything. And now it seems like the artist has to be involved in PR. I do think that there's a very big misunderstanding in the field, which is that the conventional way was that an impresario would take care of your career, when actually, if you look back and do some reading, Mozart was one of, he promoted his concerts more than anyone else. He self-promoted a great deal to the degree of, of getting programs together, getting posters hung up. So he did it all. So he in addition, been... yeah, he didn't just sit back and uh, write his beautiful operas in Concerti and everybody just came to him. So I think that this kind of concept that you're actively involved in your career and sharing is actually not something very new. I think the technology is very new, of course. I think what's unique about it is, in some way, it is an opportunity to share yourself as a human being, as a person who works with other people, and share even your family life, your thoughts, your views. So because I think what it enables the public to have access to is the person you are, aside from just the job you do as a performer. When did teaching become important to you? I think I knew fairly early. I was definitely in my bachelor's degree at Indiana University and I knew that teaching was going to be something I wanted to do. But in 1983 I met Dorothy Taubman and when I encountered her work and how profoundly it affected myself and my playing, I really, really had a passion to, to share her work with others. So it was a natural fallout, let's say, of meeting her and learning what she had to offer that I wanted to share with other people. What brought you to Dorothy Taubman? So my first meeting with Dorothy Taubman was uh, 1982, Christmas Eve. It was the only opening she had I'd called her because I saw her brochure on my teacher's coffee table in his studio. And I opened the brochure and I thought, this is a very interesting, kind of. And in the same uh, week, someone mentioned her name to me. Said, there's a woman in Brooklyn and she knows a lot about playing the piano. I don't know, that's all it took for me, personally. I was interested. I called her up and she said, I have an opening, it's Christmas Eve, come and play for me. So I went to play for her and at the time, I was in my master's degree. I had had 12 piano teachers in my life by that time, okay? So here I was in her studio and I played, she said, well, what would you like to play for me? And I played the first movement of the G, Schumann G minor sonata. And I finished playing and the first thing she said to me is, thank God there's no permanent damage to your hands. And I thought, where the heck am I? I had never encountered anyone who even looked at my hands, let alone commented on them. And then she said to me, where do you have difficulty? And I thought to myself, difficulty? I mean, no one's ever asked me that. I mean, my, the protocol I was used to from Indiana was very formal. My teacher sat at one piano. I sat at another piano. I played. She demonstrated. I played in hopes that I did just what she did. And I thought to myself, hmm, okay. She wants to play a game here? I'll play. So I thought to myself, well, there's this passage, a very famous passage. It's a jumping octave passage. It's in the first movement. And I thought to myself, well, you know, maybe about 70% of the time I get them. Maybe I don't. And I had practiced it a lot. And she sa I said, how about this passage? I'm not always secure here. So she 
came to me and she instructed me to move in a very specific way. We rehearsed it like two times. And then she said, okay, now play faster. And I did. And in that moment, I had never experienced that kind of control, ever. And I knew I hadn't heard what she told me to do ever before. And that's how the lesson proceeds. She just went to one problem spot after another. And physically, I had an experience that went from something feeling difficult to do to suddenly easy. It was kind of remarkable. So I was very intrigued by the whole thing. I remember going to Peabody and somebody telling me, you know, I think you sit too low. So what I started to do was experiment. And as I raised my bench, actually things felt a little bit better. I was kind of pleased with that. And then I thought, well, if that's good, higher probably be a little better. So I kept going higher and higher until my teacher said one day, will we need an elevator next week? I was so high. <laughs> so it's very difficult for the human body to sense at all times the parameters of what they're working with. Mm -hmm. It happened very similarly to me when I went to Indiana. When I went to Indiana, what I needed as a pianist very much converged with what my teacher had to offer. So for the initial experience with my teacher, I actually had a very big growth spurt. But what happened was the very things that helped, because I exaggerated them, which is the basic tendency of a human being to do, then the balance of elements was disrupted and therefore other issues, consequences in my playing began to develop. A new set of consequences. So what I love about the Taubman work is that you don't have to deal with the consequences of anything. Doing the Taubman work doesn't mean you won't be able to do something else that's very important to you, like play a certain type of music or express a certain type of emotion or play in a particular sound world that you want to. There's so many great videos of legendary pianists on YouTube. Wouldn't it be better to just watch those as a way to assimilate their great techniques? I think most of our field is trying to get there that way. Looking at a very great pianist and trying to emulate it in the hopes that they can arrive there. Okay, And the point is that we're talking about very intelligent people. People who go into piano and musicians are very intelligent people and they're hardworking people. I mean, they're, they're not, I've never met somebody who was able to be accepted to a conservatory who didn't have a pretty amazing work ethic. So people are working very diligently. They're very intelligent. If they could play as a virtuoso by watching somebody, they would do it. That's the whole point. But year after year, as they understand how it should look, they still can't get there. It's kind of the story you can't get there from here because I don't think that the process works most effectively that way, emulating something. I think it works better when you can discover it from the inside out. I have to be really open that when I first came to you, I was very skeptical about what I could learn from Taubman because I had great teaching from an incredible performer and teacher, Sergei Babayan. Every piano teacher out there has something very great to offer. So in my speaking, I hope that I never invalidate any other piano teacher because piano teachers don't wake up in the morning thinking, how can I ruin my student today? Exactly. They're waking up trying to find the best possible solutions to their problems, the best uh, way to advance them. The, the, the intention is completely pure and earnest. It's just not a field that has a lot of agreement. If you look to, to Schoenberg's book and he describes piano technique, he has a whole paragraph about all the contradictory statements from great artists about how the piano should be played. So we're in a field that there's no place to go to that gives a comprehensive, definitive view of how the instrument should be played. Okay? Then we're in a field that's artistic. And in art, everything is limitless. So to be an artist, you can't have set rules and boundaries, really, because art is that, that's by nature, a creation. So when, when an artist or a musician interfaces with a, a body of work 
it occurs as rigid. It occurs as rigid and dogmatic. Mm -hmm. And to know Taubman is really funny because she was the least dogmatic person I've ever met in my life. She was that. extremely flexible. She would go anywhere to solve a problem, but she was always housed in a solid foundation of her own work of what, should, what she discovered and how it worked correctly. Do you think that more time practicing at the piano always translates to better playing? Well, I think there's a big misunderstanding about that, that issue to begin with because I think most people that I've heard talk about that seem to latch on to the 10,000 hour piece of it. But the other very important piece that's mentioned in, in a book called The Talent Code, which references that study, um, does tell you that it's directed practice. It's not any old practice, mm -hmm. okay? You could view the directed piece of the whole equation as what Talbot discovered. Mm -hmm. So that's, that directed practice, maybe in 10,000 hours, would produce the result. Just practicing doesn't necessarily do that. Why do we know that? Because we know people who practice 10 hours a day yes. and still have enormous issues when they go to play. And we know that there are other people who practice an hour or two and seem to accomplish enormous things at the instrument. Mm -hmm. There's a very interesting roundtable discussion of five prominent American pianists, and it took place at the Library of Congress. And in this discussion, the question was posed, how early do you need to be a virtuoso pianist to succeed as a pianist in life. Mm -hmm. And these five pianists agreed that if you didn't have total technical command, command by the age of seven, it's pretty much over. I didn't start until I was nine. <laughs> so you, but you, people have to realize that you know, the world was flat as a function of agreement. This uh -huh. concept is a function just because five prominent American pianists decide that that doesn't necessarily mean it's true, okay? And Taubman challenged the notion. She was actually very revolutionary and very brave to challenge the notion. She didn't think that you had to be born innately with the ability or else it was forget it. And she clearly saw that practicing exercises for 30 years to build strength was ridiculous because you could find a child age seven who could play a list funerai with enormous power, and they had no years of muscular development. Bob, in your lessons, you always impart a sense of great centeredness. Is that something that was imparted to you by your teachers, or is that a function of how you live your musical life? I think what's important to say about it is that I'm not always successful, because it would be I would be I wouldn't be a human being if I didn't have my own set of frustrations, my own set of anxieties. So I, I have those things. But I think what I try very much is to stay in action, even though the circumstances might look like I should stop. I'm not always successful, but I find that when I feel the best and I feel the most productive and the most um, fulfilled is when I'm not worrying so much about all of those other things. And I am just find myself kind of in the action of what it takes to do it. Whether it's practicing or teaching or traveling or whatever it is, if I just go with it, I feel a little bit happier.